In this video, I'm going to show you how to take clear, readable photos of old tombstones. Many people take pictures of tombstones for their family history and genealogies. Most tombstones are easy to photograph, but if you've been taking pictures in cemeteries for a while, you have seen some stones that are worn, discolored, or have stuff growing on them. In these cases, it can be tough to read the inscription, and even tougher to get a readable photograph. The older the stones are, the more interesting and valuable they are to genealogy and family history. There's a lot of advice on the net about improving gravestone photos. Most of it is not very helpful. Trying to fix poor tombstone photos using photo editing software is an exercise in futility. The off-camera flash technique I'm about to show you is the closest thing I have ever seen to a magic bullet for photography. It makes a huge difference. Seriously, this has made the biggest improvement in my photos since I learned to take the lens cap off. This makes the difference between being able to make out a few letters and being able to read every last word. If you'd like to learn the simple technique that can turn this picture into this one, keep watching. So, how does this work? With tombstones, what we're trying to photograph is carved relief. The inscription is physically recessed or in some cases sticks up from the face of the stone but the incised portion of the stone is usually exactly the same color as the rest of the stone. The only reason you can ever see the inscription at all is because of shadows. If there was absolutely even light from all directions, even the best inscription would be nearly invisible. Unfortunately, a bright daytime sky often provides fairly uniform light from all directions. So, since we're trying to photograph shadows, we had better bring our own shadows. Here are some typical external camera flashes. The main thing you need to know about these is that at close range, they are brighter than the sun. That means they can create shadows that are visible even in bright sunshine. The other great thing is they're portable. You can put the light exactly where you want it. What we want to do is light up the tombstone at a shallow angle from the side, above, or some combination of the two. Your first choice should be down across the face of the stone at a 45 degree angle. But you always want the light coming in nearly parallel to the face of the stone. The downside of this method is that it may require you to have some equipment you don't already own. The good news is it doesn't have to be very expensive. Here's what you need and some ideas on how to keep the cost down. The first item you need is a camera with a hot shoe. This is the standard flash attachment point on the top of the camera. Your camera also needs to have a manual settings mode where you control the shutter speed and aperture. This will usually be designated by an M on the control dial or in the menus of the camera. Virtually every DSLR camera will have a hot shoe in manual mode. They are also available on a variety of less expensive cameras, including some compact cameras. Older used camera models can be had cheaply and they are more than capable of this type of photography. You don't need a lot of megapixels, you don't need the latest sensor technology, and you don't need removable lenses. So if you need to go camera shopping, look for the M and the hot shoe. Sometimes the hot shoe is covered up by a little plastic cover, so look out for that. This is a typical external flash. Canon and Nikon both call these speed lights, but use different spellings. You do not need to have a brand name flash for this purpose. There are third-party flash units for sale in the range of $40 to $80 new that will do just fine for photographing tombstones. The main difference between the name brands and the bargain brands is that the name brands support automatic flash exposure. If you've been looking for an excuse to get the latest Nikon flash and your budget will stand the $500 or so, go for it. But if you decide you don't need the automatic stuff, you can get away a lot cheaper. I bought this older model Canon flash used for $20. Your mileage may vary. So now you have a camera with a hot shoe and a flash unit with a hot shoe mount. But we're not going to put the flash on the camera. Instead, we want the flash to fire remotely, about 15 feet away, over by the tombstone. There's several ways to do this. You can use a long flash extender cord. You can use the built-in flash control system of your camera if your spiffy brand name flash supports it. Or you can use these thrifty little radio remotes. This is the Cowboy Studio NPT-4 wireless flash trigger. It has two parts, a transmitter which fits on the camera and a receiver which fits on the flash. This kit currently sells for about $21 on Amazon. This thing is simplicity itself. When the camera says flash, the signal goes to the receiver and it fires the flash. 
it doesn't support any exposure automation or other fancy stuff, which we don't want for our purposes anyway. There's just one more thing you need, a photographer's assistant. You can also use a flash stand or tripod for holding the flash, but an assistant is a lot easier if you can find a cooperative one. Okay, that should be everything you need. Now let's dial in the camera settings. I'm going to show you this on my Canon T1i, but it should be pretty similar on other cameras. Before we go over the settings, I want to give you an idea of why we're using these particular settings. I'm assuming that you will be taking photos in the daytime. After all, if you go wandering around the cemetery at night, you are liable to fall into a grave and disappear. Since you're here in the daytime, there's probably sun. The sun and bright sky tend to make shadows disappear. In order to have good shadows in our picture, we need the flash to overpower the sun. So we are adjusting the camera to minimize the contribution of the sun as much as possible relative to the flash. If no flash was fired, these camera settings would result in a picture that is deliberately two or three stops underexposed under bright sunny conditions. Okay, let's get started. First, put your camera in manual mode. If your camera has a menu for control of an external flash, make sure that the external flash is enabled. Set your shutter speed to 1 200th of a second. I picked this number because it is my camera's maximum flash sync speed. Because the flash emits all its light in an extremely short pulse, using a fast shutter speed dims the sun but doesn't affect flash at all. However, we don't want to go faster than the camera's flash sync speed. Most cameras have a flash sync speed of 1 200th or faster, so this should work on your camera also. If you do exceed your camera's flash sync speed, you will get an ominous black or very dark bar over part of the photo. Set your aperture to f20. This is an estimate based on the idea that the flash is going to be about two to three stops brighter than the sun. After you take your first photo, if it is under or overexposed, you should adjust the aperture to correct the exposure. Remember, bigger f numbers mean less light and smaller f numbers mean more light. That's an easy pair of numbers to remember, 1 200th of a second at f20. In manual mode, we've selected a specific shutter speed and aperture. However, the camera may still try to automate the exposure by adjusting the ISO, which is the light sensitivity of the sensor. We need to stop it from doing that because the camera would screw things up. It doesn't have any idea that a flash is going to fire or how bright it's going to be. The ISO setting probably defaults to automatic. Take it off of automatic and put it on ISO 100. So now we have a manual ISO as well as manual shutter and aperture. Don't forget to put the transmitter on the camera. Make sure your radio remote is attached to the flash and that the remote is turned on. Turn on your flash. If your flash has adjustable power, start out with full power. If you like, you can reduce it later. If you can adjust the beam width of the flash, select a wider beam. On this flash, the beam width corresponds to focal lengths, so what you want is a lower number like 35 instead of 50. If your flash doesn't seem to illuminate enough of the tombstone, you can always move the flash a little further away. We're ready to take some photos now. Have your assistant hold the flash about 1 to 2 meters away from the tombstone and shoot. The great thing about digital cameras is instant feedback. Take a look at your photo to make sure the flash went off and the photo is exposed properly. It usually takes me a couple of tries to get the flash pointed exactly right. If the photo is overexposed, you should either move the flash further away from the tombstone, reduce the flash power, or adjust the aperture. If you double the distance between the flash and the subject, that is equivalent to a two-stop reduction in exposure. If the photo is underexposed, you should probably adjust to a larger aperture, that is a smaller F number. Remember to take another photo without flash with your camera on full automatic so you have a before and after test of this technique. Here are some before and after shots of the results of using off-camera flash in cemetery photography. Enjoy.